It's a great Easter morning. It's a beautiful sunny day. It's a little bit cool as it often is here in New York State at this time of year. As we get started this morning, as I begin to share with you, I'd like to begin by commenting on the fact that none of us ever like to do anything in vain. We don't like to do things in vain. Now, things can start off small that you can do in vain. You can be tying your shoe in the morning and the shoelace breaks. And in vain did you just tie your shoe. You've got to start all over again. That's a little thing. Or it might be something that's a little bit bigger thing. It might be a project that you're working on. And I was thinking of Gary in this sense, in terms of you might be working on a car project or something like that. You get everything all put back together again. The rest of you, it could be a different thing other than a car. And just as you get the carburetor rebuilt, or the transmission put back in the car again, or the engine put back in the car, you see this one extra piece. And you sigh because that had to go on the very inside. So in vain did you put it together. You gotta to take it all apart and put it in to where it has to go. Sadly enough, I think all of us that have done home projects have realized they sometimes put extra pieces in those different projects, which you don't really need anyway. You can just throw them away. I'm joking on that. But you kind of feel that way. You wish it was something that uh, you had remembered. Or sometimes you can have the agony of soul when you realize that you've invested years of your life in something and it has been in vain. It could be a business. You might have invested a number of years trying to get something off the ground, get it started, had a vision, had a hope, and it just wasn't going to make it. Could have been a farm. A person, many people start off with farms and ideas of what they're going to do. Maybe they're going back to homesteading. Maybe they are, have some sort of a commercial application in mind. But after a while, you just realize it's just not going to make it. And all that time, all that energy, all that effort is wasted. Or it could be a ministry. A person could have invested a great deal of time and it's something that they've tried to do to accomplish for the Lord and for His glory. And yet, after a period of time, you just realize it's not going to go any further as far as whatever that project might have been. On his second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul traveled from Athens to Corinth. It was right after Paul preached the famous sermon on Mars Hill. And on Mars Hill, he had preached and he had begun his preaching by talking about how he was preaching, and he was representing the unknown God at that particular time. That's the end of Acts chapter 17. You finish Acts chapter 17. Chapter 18 starts off by saying that Paul traveled from there, and he went to Corinth. You read on down through Acts chapter 18, the first few verses, and describes his ministry in Corinth and how he taught and preached. And you read further, and you realize he had a ministry there for a year and a half. And he was preaching, he was teaching there in Corinth for a year and a half. And finally, with some opposition, um, he ended up having to move on. And he left that particular town, he headed to Caesarea, and then from Caesarea on back to Jerusalem. And that was the end of his second journey. Then he started off on his next journey, and uh, he ended up in some different places, of course, including Ephesus. And the problem, however, though, was back in Corinth, and that things were all not wonderful back there. And so Paul had to write some letters to them. The first letter that he wrote to them is not preserved for us. We don't have it in Scripture. The second letter he wrote, or maybe letter third, fourth, who knows, but one of his later letters we know as 1 Corinthians, and it's in your Bibles. It's the first recorded, preserved book that we have there, 1 Corinthians. And after Paul dealt with a number of different issues in the earlier chapters going through the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul gets uh, further on into the book, and he was very concerned. He was concerned because he was afraid that his ministry might have been in vain. He was afraid that the belief that the believers had had in Corinth in him might also have been in vain. We don't want to do something that's in vain, whether it's tying your shoe, whether it's putting back something together that you've taken apart, or whether it's the investment of your life. And Paul had spent a year and a half there. And during that year and a half, he had seen the believers grow but things were still problematic back there in Corinth. Uh, Paul dealt with the different problems, and he finally communicated uh, in, in this particular letter that he was afraid that what his investment might have been in vain. Our text this morning, this Easter Sunday, is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 begins with Paul making a comment about, I'm afraid that it might have been in vain in terms of what your belief has been. 
Paul then goes on in the balance of chapter 15 to talk about the resurrection. And that's the reason for choosing that for today, because Paul's going to give a tremendous argument for the resurrection in the balance of chapter 15. Paul shares about what Christ has done. He points out the fact that they in Corinth had heard, had received, had believed, and he hopes it wasn't in vain. And he's challenging them right now that because he had taught them from the, with the basic teachings of the gospel in the first few verses, he was hoped that they would recognize and hold to those first things that he had taught them. My challenge for you today from 1 Corinthians 15 is that faith in the resurrection is not blind faith. It's not something that you just sort of close your eyes and hope it's true. It's not a blind faith. Instead, there are strong arguments but faith in the resurrection is reason to be steadfast in your faith and to put all your energy into the work of the Lord. And that's what we'll be looking at here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today, looking through the whole chapter. Now, I, I do have to mention that 1 Corinthians 15 is a lengthy chapter. It's 58 verses. And so I'm going to have to go fast at times. Not hopefully talking fast, but I can't give as much attention to every single verse all the way through. As we get started, though, I will share with you that the structure of what I'm going to be going over breaks into three parts. In verses 1 through 4, Paul gives the foundation of the gospel. And then in verses 5 through 57, Paul then gives a strong statement of why the resurrection is significant, plausibility he deals with, arguments, witness, he deals with all an argument for the resurrection in verses 5 through 57. And then finally, he closes the chapter in verse 58 with a challenge to the believers in Corinth. On the basis of what he has now said and presented about the resurrection, this is how you need to respond. So what I'll be sharing with you today will roughly follow the structure of the text in that sense, beginning with Paul's foundation in verses 1 through 4, and then going on from there. In verses 1 through 4, which I'm going to read in just a minute, before I read it, I would point out it has two different parts. Verses 1 to 2 uh, explains what Paul has done and how they responded. And verses 3 and 4 explains what the essence, the essentials are of the gospel message. Paul begins by identifying that it was the gospel that he preached right off at the beginning in verse 1. I'll begin reading then. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. I'm going to stop mid-sentence there, verse 4 but just at the end of this description where Paul gives that which is of first importance. As we, looked at this, I, as we look at this, I would point out that Paul uh, preached the gospel foundation. And in verses 1 and 2, Paul identifies how they responded to it. It wasn't just something that they heard in a passing way. You can sometimes see a quick television commercial, or you can sometimes even read a book or an article very quickly, and it can have very insignificant impact on your life. You also can read some books or some passages, some quotations sometimes, that really challenge you because that's right where your life is at that particular time. You might be encouraged, you might be convicted, you might be uh, inspired to do something by that quotation, by whatever it might happen to have been. Or it could be something that just sort of your mind is in a different place and it just slides right by. The point that Paul is making right here though is that what he preached and what he had received did not just slide by them, nor did they accept it in a casual way at all. But Paul specifically identifies that, he says, this was something that I preached, you received, and in which you also stand. So Paul is making the point that that which they believed in the past has a present impact on their life. This is where you are right now. This is the basis for your faith. It's where you're standing at the moment. In which, verse 2 by which also you are saved. And Paul says the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ was the means by which you were saved when you put your faith and trust in him when I preached to you 
so many years ago during the time that I was with you there in Corinth, back in Acts chapter 18. But then there's the condition in the middle of that verse, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you. There's a challenge here that's underlying what Paul is saying. Said, it's important that you hold on to what you've received already. It wasn't just something that you made an academic agreement with or that you made a passing commitment to. He says you have to hold on if you hold on, if you hold on to that which I preach to you, unless you had believed in vain. And Paul presents here at the beginning of this chapter a challenge for them to consider in light of what has been influencing them that he's going to speak to in the, in the middle of the chapter right here. He's challenging them to consider, are they going to hold on? Now, Paul then goes on the next two verses and he's very clear about what the essence is of the gospel message. And we understand the gospel message is certainly the message of John 3.16, God gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the belief in Christ that's essential. But Paul gets very specific in the next two verses. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Now, notice how Paul is calling special attention. This is of first importance. This is essential. This is foundational. This is bedrock. This is what everything else is built upon. And it is this that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. We can see in Paul's other writings, particularly in uh, Romans, also in Galatians, that Paul identifies the fact that Christ did not die because he deserved to, because he had to. He died bearing our sins in his body on the cross. We can see that in numerous places in the New Testament, Christ took our sins upon himself. So Paul says Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. And there's, people don't have trouble believing and understanding that. They understand a Roman crucifixion. It is final. It is fatal. It is absolute. You don't live after a Roman crucifixion. So Christ died. He was crucified. He was buried. No problems there. And Paul says then, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And there's the third part of what's essential to believe. And some people have no trouble believing the first two. Yeah, a man died. Yeah, Christ died. Yeah, he was buried. That makes sense. That's all part of it. But the empty tomb on the third day, well, I'm not so sure about that. Doubts enter. People question it. And there were certainly people in Corinth that were causing the believers to wonder about, well, what about the resurrection? And they were putting ideas in people's minds, in people's head. The problem here, the sticking point, is the resurrection. Now, I mentioned to you back in Acts chapter 18 that that was where Paul left Athens and he ended up going to Corinth. If you go back just a couple of verses before that, it describes the outcome from Paul's sermon at Mars Hill. You remember the sermon on Mars Hill, Acts chapter 17. Paul preached about how God would have all people everywhere to put their faith and trust in him. And he sent, uh, he sent a man, his son, and his son was crucified and then he rose from the dead. And then... Bang, the next verse says, and when they heard about someone raising from the dead, some sneered and others believed and said, we will hear you further on this particular matter. Those are the last verses right before Acts 18 begins. And so the point here is that when Paul preached the resurrection of the dead on Mars Hill in Athens, it was a turning point for many of those that had been listening with all ears to everything he was saying up to that point. Because the resurrection from the dead was something that they had a problem with. They had difficulty with that. So with that as a beginning, that as a background, we can have to consider why is this such a problem. I would throw out to you for your consideration that Jesus made a point, and he was talking to the Pharisees, that Satan has been a liar and a deceiver right from the very beginning. In John 8, 44, Jesus made the point that he was a liar, he's a deceiver from the beginning, and he always has been. If you turn back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, we see that Satan, speaking through the serpent, speaks to Eve, and he asks Eve, what has God said? And Eve answers that question, and his immediate response is, you shall not surely die. And he gives an explanation for that. Right from the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden, Satan is lying. He's misrepresenting the truth. 
He's been a deceiver from the very beginning. And the point that Jesus is making is that Satan is a deceiver. He's speaking to the Pharisees that he doesn't have very many kind words for them as well. But the point is that Satan has been a deceiver from the very beginning in terms of how he would want to try to misrepresent the truth of God's word. He misrepresented the truth of what God commanded Adam and Eve, and he misrepresents the truth contained in the gospel as well. So people that hear that you have to believe that Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus was raised from the dead, Satan wants to attack the third part. He wants to give reason to doubt, reason to question, reason for non-saved, people that haven't trusted Christ, to question, is it really viable, is it really potentially true that Jesus would, a man would rise from the dead? Now, if you're wanting to enter any kind of a competition or contest, as Satan certainly can be seen being in contest against the truth of the word of God, there is a tactical advantage if you can take the fight out of your enemy and deceive them. It doesn't matter what the type of contest is. It doesn't matter whether it's a wrestling match or some other type of a competition or a battlefield. If you can take some of the fight out of whoever your adversary is, you've got an advantage on him right there. Uh, it's interesting because Satan does this with believers and unbelievers. You see, if he can get people to doubt the truth, he has a tactical advantage because believers no longer have a reason to put their heart fully into trusting and serving God. And unbelievers, they begin to question if they even should at all. So Satan works from the standpoint of deceit to try to misrepresent and to fool. Commander Mark Metcalf. Uh, and the U.S. Navy retired, uh, has written on strategy. He has described an ancient Chinese book that describes military strategy called The Art of War. It's been attributed to Sun Tzu, written approximately 2,500 years ago. This is, if you're not familiar with it, it's a tremendously significant work. It's influenced military strategy for 2,500 years, all the way up through the current time period. And Commander Metcalf points out that this book is still influencing present Chinese uh, military tactics in terms of how they are planning and what they are doing. In this particular book, The Art of War, it's broken up into 12 different emphases that presumably Sun Tzu had, uh, had put together and had assembled back at that time when there was a t warring dynasties there in China. And the last section of those, uh, it mentions that War is a form of deception. And what you try to do is to try to break down the morale of your enemy. You have different ways of doing that. This was in Sun Tzu and Art of War uh, writings. And the purpose is to try to gain a tactical advantage. Now, Commander Metcalf has some credentials to his name. He has graduate degrees in Chinese from University of Arizona, University of Cambridge, and he's a professor and teacher at University of Virginia. So he knows a thing or two about how to interpret and understand the Chinese. There's a lot of question about whether or not people really understand the art of war at all. He's got the credentials and he, has, he can appropriately make some observations there. The point though is that war is deception. You want to fool, you want to fake your enemy. You want to try to make them think that their advantages are really disadvantages. You want to try to make them think that they don't really have a great potential of winning. So if you take that principle, military strategy, and consider Satan, Satan then approaches his adversary, Christ, and the truth of the gospel with the purpose of deceiving those who are unsaved and causing Christians to question the validity of the truth of the gospel because he gains a tactical advantage. He discourages them. He discourages us. If he can, through his lies, cause us to question what the Bible has to say in whatever place it happens to be, we are disadvantaged and we can't hang on, hold fast, and continue on strong in the work of God. So as we look at the passage today, we have to recognize Satan is the adversary, he lies, and in this chapter, Paul will argue against his lie that the resurrection truly does have significant reasons for belief. Satan uses someone as a proxy in Corinth. 
for the purpose of presenting questions about the validity of the resurrection. We can see that in Paul's argument and how he comes back. I'll just call your attention quickly to verse 20. Verse 20, Paul says, but now, um, I'm sorry, verse 12. Verse 12, Paul says, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Okay, here Paul is identifying, he's nailing the point right here. He said, there's some among you that are questioning whether or not the resurrection is, is even a fact. And that's what I mean, that Satan has his proxy in Corinth that's arguing against the fact of the resurrection so he can undermine the faith of the believers in Corinth. And Paul's dealing with that in a major way in this particular chapter. So in verses 1 through 4, Paul has given the foundation, and he has explained about this is the gospel, this is what was essential for you to believe. Now in verses 5 through 57, Paul gives the argument for the resurrection and that it's significant. Paul begins in verses 5 through 8 by citing witnesses. In verses 5 through 8, Paul starts listing them off. Now, if you wanted to see some, if you wanted to know about something that you hadn't personally seen, it's certainly reasonable to try to interview or talk to or connect with someone who did have eyewitness, eyeball on the scene, a view of what took place. So Paul calls as his first argument the witnesses that have seen the resurrected Christ. In the next verses, he then begins by saying, verse 5, that Christ appeared to Cephas, or Peter. Then he appeared to the twelve, the twelve disciples. After that, verse 6, I think this is very significant. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. The point that Paul's making and the fact that Christ appeared to 500 at one time is that individual witnesses and scenarios might be able to be discounted. But when you have a group of 500 at one time, they all see, they all experience, they're all there at the same time, they see and recognize each other, they know they were all collectively there, that's very, very hard to argue against. And the point that Paul's making, and that some are still, most still survive, is that if you really want to check this out, you believers in Corinth, there are people you can talk to that have seen the resurrected Christ. It's not just me and the apostles. There's a whole bunch back there in Judea. And you could go, you could talk to one more, you could talk to a number of them if you want to. So Paul's making a strong case by appealing to the witnesses. And then he mentions as he goes on, also to James. And then last of all, he appeared to me as the least of the apostles. So Paul's making the statement, first of all, that here's one argument right here. There are multiple witnesses. They've seen it. They know that Christ has, has been risen and you can talk to them if you want to today. They're still alive. You can go back there if there's a need to. And so we can see these witnesses. There have, however, been those people that were questioning that, as I already pointed out from verse 12. But after Paul raises the question, Paul then goes on and points out that there's a great significance to the resurrection. This is nothing just to be minimized as though it's not of great consequence to you as a believer. There's tremendous significance. And he points out the significance in two ways. First, he points out the significance for us as believers. And then he points out the significance in terms of Christ's witness, his work, his ministry at all. In the first part, Paul identifies that in verse 17, he says, Now, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if we hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men the most to be pitied. So Paul points out there's tremendous significance at stake here. He said, you can't just sort of sweep this under the rug. You can't look the other way. This has significance for your life as a child of God, as a believer. You've got to understand that you, if, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, you can't just sort of ignore that and go on your merry way with the Christian life. We're of all things to be pitied. We have no hope. We're hopeless in this world. In fact, later on, Paul sort of continued this idea. At verse 32, he says, If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? For if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And Paul 
shrugs it off. He says, I be, there is no hope. There's nothing for us as a believer. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, you can't just assume to be a Christian and ignore the fact of Christ's resurrection. It has tremendous significance here for us as, children, as God's children. But then Paul goes on to the second significance in verses 20 through 28, where he points out the significance for the work of Christ. Now, keep in mind, Christ, God, the Son, God in human form, in physical form here on earth, all of the Old Testament has been pointing and looking forward to that. The whole book of Hebrews points out how Christ has fulfilled all the sacrificial system. He is the culmination of the whole priestly system. He's the culmination of all in the Old Testament. It's in Christ. This is the major work of God for the redemption of mankind. This is like all of history up to that point is all pointing up to this particular time when Christ would die on the cross. But it's part of God's plan, not just that Christ would redeem mankind, but he also would be exalted. And the next verses that show the significance of the resurrection tie in to what Christ ultimately will do as he is ruler and he reigns over all. Going on then, in verse 22, Paul points out, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and after that those who are Christ at his coming. And then comes, actually back up to verse 21. For since by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Paul references the fact that you inherited a sinful nature, a mortality that was sealed when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. As a descendant, a daughter of Eve, or a son of Adam, you inherited that sin. We are personally also responsible for our sin. We stand accountable before God. And the point that Paul's making is just as in Adam all die, now he's saying, but the resurrection is going to be because of Christ, one man. In Christ, he'll be made alive. But each in his own order, now picking up with verse 23, Christ the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ's at his coming. And Paul now has shifted from looking backwards to looking forward. We sang that Anne played the song about the Jerusalem, the, it looked back, it also had a forward look. And there's a sense with, with Christ is coming back again. And when Christ comes back again, those who have died in Christ will be resurrected, will rise up. That's what Paul's point is. Then those who are Christ at Christ's coming. And then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be abolished is death. These are words of enthusiastic excitement that Paul is saying. This is something that should just sort of almost like a crescendo and a, a piece of music builds to a, a high point. Paul is building here to a high point. Do you see that this is coming? This is the ultimate, this is the end. This is how everything is going to wrap up at a future day of time. It's looking ahead, it's anticipating that particular time. Going on, verse 27, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. And a little bit of word explanation here about what that means by all things in subjection. And Paul goes on, uh, verse 28, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. This is a, a crescendo that just starts off quiet, gets louder and louder, a crescendo. And for those of you that don't have the music theory background, a crescendo starts off quieter and gets louder and louder and louder. And that's what's happening here. Paul is getting louder and louder and bigger and bigger in terms of what he's saying. It's looking toward that culmination, that ultimate end. And he's saying, this is what it's leading to when Christ is over all. And he looks forward to that. He, he's pointing out the significance of all, that this is, of all that's taking place. Because there's significance to Christ's resurrection. It's all part of God's master plan where ultimately all will be under his authority. Then Paul goes on to an explanation. There's some, 
we look at verse 35, and you probably can ask yourself, what does that mean? He's talking about the uh, baptism for the dead. How are the dead raised? With what body? And, and you, you might wonder, what is that talking about? Verse 29. Excuse me, verse 29. Um, and then I will say this, that if you look up the questions and answers of 40 different interpreters, you'll probably find at least 42 or 43 different answers for, for what that is, as some might be torn between two, and they're just in the mix right there. But you certainly, you don't lose the whole argument for the sake of the question of this one verse, because Paul is building his argument he goes on from that and he says, what's the point of me having tried to have fought wild beasts in Ephesus? What's the profit if the dead do not rise? And so Paul makes some points right here. He goes on, he continues his argument. Verse 35, he says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of a body do they come? Now, read the next two words. Paul sort of minimizes that position. You fool. <laughs> I mean, he's, uh, he, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't act diplomatically right here. He says, a person might say, well, how does all this work? Paul throws out the question that someone might ask for the purpose of answering it. What he's doing now is he's dealing with feasibility. He's saying this is how it works. He's given the example of witnesses. He's pointed out the significance for us as believers, the significance for the master plan of God, and now he's pointing out, and this is how it works, just so you understand how the resurrection can work. And so he says, verses 35 to 49, uh, I read verse, verse 35, then he says, uh, going on to verse 36, you fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. That which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds, a body of its own. And so the point that Paul's making is here that when you plant a seed, we used to have cornfields over here and sometimes soybeans, and now we're growing asphalt. At least that's what it looks like out the window. <laughs> that's new for us in 2023. But for the farmers that actually have arable uh, things that you, where you can grow, they put the seed in, but the seed itself is not what you finally it's not what you're going to get. The seed's going to grow, it's going to die. It has to die to itself, and then you finally have the plant, whether it's of wheat, whether it's tomatoes or lima beans, so I can't understand why anybody would plant those. But you plant something that's worthwhile, hopefully not lima beans, and it grows, the seed dies, but the plant grows, and you get something from that in the end. In case you had noticed, I don't like lima beans. The point that Paul's making is that that what you sow is not the end result. You sow one thing, but it grows up in a different plant. And he's saying the same thing with the resurrection from the dead. The body that we have, that you have, that I have today, has to die. But my body has to die in order that I might have a new body and a new life. And that's the point that Paul's making. This is how it works. You question how it happens, how it works. The body you got has to die. And then, after that, then you have the resurrection from the dead. So Paul goes on and explains how it works in verses 35 down to verse 39. Verse 42, he says, so is the resurrection from the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. You certainly think about the gradual decline, just natural course of life. We're all gonna die. And for those of us that have more gray hairs than some of the rest of you, we feel it in our bodies, and in our bodies, we know that we can't do the same things we could when we were in our 20s. We wish we could. Sometimes we foolishly try, but anyway, we can't. <laughs> the body's decline is not the same. And the point that Paul is making, when you finally get to the end, no matter what the age is, whether it's in your 80s or 90s, whatever it is, that body that you see there lying in the casket is not the body that it once was when it was in its 20s. And the point that Paul's made here, it is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And the point that Paul's making is that this is how it works. You have to die first in order to be raised in the second body, in the new body. And point is, Paul's making a point 
this is how it works. To, you've got to understand it there in Corinth. You've got to understand the resurrection is important. It's natural. It's feasible. This is how the system works. He's explaining feasibility. He's explaining how everything works together here. This is how it comes. In verses 35 through 49, Paul makes this particular point. And then in verses 50 through 57, Paul makes the point of what is coming. These are the glorious verses that we often gravitate, and with reasonableness to do so, at times of funerals. Those that have put their faith and trust in Christ, it's anticipation of these days and this situation that's pictured in verses 50 through 57. This is what's coming. Paul is saying, this is how it works. The body has to die. It's not going to be the same. It's got to die in, this, in order for it to be changed to the new body. And this is what you've got to look forward to in these verses. Verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. There's his transition verse. He talks about it has to die first. It has to be gone away with. The flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The perishable, that which dies, cannot inherit the imperishable. But I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on the immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have pull on, put on immortality, then will be brought about the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but the power of the sin is the law. And thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Those are wonderful, wonderful promises. And Paul's making the point, this is what you're looking, this is what you have in the resurrection. Remember what he had said earlier? He said, if there's no resurrection of the dead, we are of all people most to be pitied. He says, we're without faith, we're without hope. Those who have died in Christ, they're perished, they're gone. And I fought with wild beasts and I, was, I faced persecution and torture unnecessarily if the dead are not raised. And Paul says, this is what we have to look forward to. This particular day, this particular time, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In doing so, Paul has finished his argument in terms of why the resurrection has a reason for faith. I spoke at the beginning and I said that faith in the resurrection is a faith that must be exercised, but it's not a blind faith. It's not just, there's no basis for it. Paul's given a, almost a 50 verse explanation here about why the resurrection is significant and important. So then Paul wraps around again in the last verse, verse 58. And in verse 58, he says, the resurrection can be believed in and it's a reason to go on for Christ. He says in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. I'd like to point out two commands in this particular verse. The idea that he has about being steadfast, unmovable, I believe that with the structure that Paul is making a singular point here that ties into what he said back in the first verses. In the first verses, he says, you are saved, verse 2, if you hold fast what I preach to you. That's where Paul got started. Hang on. If you hold fast. Now at the very end, he's saying, hold fast, be steadfast, be immovable. His command here is that you need to hang on to your faith. Hold fast, hold strong, hold secure, hold tightly, grasp on. Paul's saying, hang on to that. Hold on to that tightly. There's a reason for it. I just gave you 50 verses explaining it. There's a reason to hold on to that. And then he says, secondly, always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
You see, the believers in Corinth could have been discouraged because of those that were questioning the resurrection. Do you remember what I pointed out about Commander Metcalf and he, what he has observed from the art of war and Chinese military strategy? Part of that is to discourage the morale of your enemy. You keep him discouraged and he doesn't have as much of the fight left in him. He's not as committed anymore. And so Satan, who has been a deceiver, and Commander Metcalf's point, out, point is that Chinese military warfare is always based on deception. And it's always based on trying to deceive and to try to fool and fake out the enemy based upon the art of war. And so if Satan, the master deceiver, wants to be opposed to the work of Christ, what better way is there than that he can undermine your faith as a believer and make you question any of the truths or promises in God's word. Now, by way of application to now 2,000 years later, I believe that, by and large, within our Christian community, we accept the resurrection of Christ from the dead. We may not have quite as many detractors as they might have had in Paul's day, but the methods of Satan are the same. He still wants to discourage you and discourage me in terms of our Christian faith, because he's a liar and has been from the very beginning. And if he can take the fight out of you by making you believe a lie about Christ or the Word of God or promise in Scripture, he has just set you off kilter slightly, and you're not going to be holding fast or abounding in the work of the Lord. He's just more or less neutralized you as a soldier for Christ because he has made you ineffective and set you on a shelf. Now, if he can do that to a number of the soldiers of the Lord or people of God, he can neutralize the work of the church by causing believers to question the vital truths. This argument in this chapter was on the resurrection, but Satan doesn't limit his arguments just to attacks on the resurrection. People today, that may not be the primary area as it was back in Paul's day in Corinth. I would throw out to you for your consideration several of these and imagine how these can cause the people of God to shrink back from holding on or shrink back from the work of God at all. What if Satan were to present to you the lie that your prayers are not that effective? You've been praying for that prayer for the last 15 years. You've never seen an answer to that prayer. You see, God doesn't really care. He doesn't know about that. In fact, there are more things in this world that God cares about than what you're praying about right now. And God, Satan gets you to stop believing that your prayers are effective. That's a lie. That's a lie from Satan, and Satan knows he can neutralize your power if he gets you to believe that lie. Or what about a different lie? He says, I know the Bible preaches and says something that you can be completely forgiven. Your sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ. They are nailed to the cross, but not your sins. Because what you did was different. Because your relationship with God, because of what you did, it was worse than anything else. Your sins will never be forgiven, no matter what the Bible says. And Satan whispers in the ear of God's children, damning contradictions and lies to the word of God, and he neutralizes a child of God by his lies. He's taken the fight out of them. They no longer want to hold on. They no longer care about the work of God because they're now depressed, discouraged, and they have no more will to fight or to go on for Christ. Or what about the lie that Satan might have? He might say, your witness is ineffective. You've been trying to witness to your friends You've been trying to witness to your family member for years and years since you trusted Christ. You haven't gotten anywhere, and you never will, because you're never going to convince them. Your old life, is a, you're, you've been a hypocrite before them, and they've seen it in your life, and you've not held up, the, you've not had a good testimony for them. You will never be of a testimony that's going to accomplish anything for God, so you might as well stop trying. You hear that enough times over a period of time of Satan whispering in your ear, and it will take the fight out of you. And you no longer will be wanting to hold on or to continue on in the work of the Lord. Or what about another lie when Satan whispers in your ear? He says, you know, 
Look at the news. Have you been watching the news lately, Christian? You might think that Christ is coming back, but I've got this world, and I'm taking it straight down the road to hell, and there's nothing that you can do to stop it. You can watch Fox News all you want, but you're not going to change society. You can talk to your friends all you want about the awfulness of our direction that things are going, but you're never going to make a difference because I'm leading this country and I'm leading this world in a certain direction. And he can cause God's children to stop praying and to stop trusting God and to stop caring about how they are called to be salt and light and the platforms where God places them, on the stages where God puts you. We, are, we don't all stand on the same stage. You stand on a different stage from me, and so does the person sitting on the opposite side of this room. You are to be salt and light in the place where God puts you. You are to be a child of God, and as Paul said in verse 58, you are to be abounding in the work of the Lord on the stage where God puts you and puts me. God calls us individually, but Satan whispers lies. But if he can take the fight out of us as children, as God's children, he's accomplished his purpose. Or what about this last one? You know, Christian, you live a pretty good life. Don't worry about that one little sin, that thing that nobody else really knows too much about. It's okay. You can just sort of ignore that. You can be a good Christian and still have that one little sin in that corner of your life. For one person, it might be bitterness. For another person, it could be pride. For someone else, it could be pornography. For someone else, it might be anger. For someone else, it could be, and you can fill in the blank. The point is that Satan gets you to minimize the sin in your life personally. And when you do that, you are a defeated Christian, and he has basically taken you out of the ranks of those that are abounding in the work of the Lord. Because Satan is a deceiver, and he's out to convince God's people that they are not accomplishing anything and can't for God. Because if he destroys their morale, is what the strategy is, he has effectively removed them from the fight completely. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, there's a very significant fight that Paul was focusing on. I've broadened it here at the end to show that Satan's schemes and mechanisms are the same today. We don't face necessarily the same arguments they faced in the first century. Belief in the resurrection is essential for us today, too. And for a person that's unsaved, questioning Christ's resurrection from the dead is something that must be accepted by faith. You know, when the disciples first heard that Jesus rose from the dead, when the women brought news to them, if you look back there in the Gospels, it says, in Luke, it says, and they didn't believe the women. They thought that they were crazy. <laughs> the women brought the message back that Christ had risen. They thought, that couldn't be. And then later, Thomas isn't there when the other disciples see the risen Lord. And so Thomas says to them, unless I can see and unless I can put my finger in, the pierced, in his pierced hand, unless I can put my hand in his side, I will never believe. And Christ later appeared when Thomas was there. But did you remember what Christ said to Thomas? He said, blessed are you because you've seen and believed. Blessed are those who don't see and believe. That's where it is for us today. And that's where it is for a person that's wrestling with the truth claims of the gospel. Do you believe because of the arguments of 1 Corinthians 15? No. Are the arguments there? Yes. But it's a matter of faith. It must be accepted by faith. We accept by faith that Christ was crucified, that he was buried, that he rose from the dead. We have reasons to believe it, but we base it on faith, not just the reasons. The reasons can be argued against. It's a matter of faith. The disciples didn't believe at first, and Thomas, when he interacted with the Lord, Christ said, blessed are those who do not see but yet believe. In other words, they believe what the Bible has to say. We have a Christianity based on faith. It is based on faith in what God's finished work has been. It's faith that Christ was crucified, buried, and rose from the dead. And we celebrate that today on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter. So the challenge I would have for you today 
going back to the very beginning, is faith in the resurrection is not blind faith. There are strong arguments, but faith in the resurrection is reason to be steadfast in your faith and to put all your energy into the work of the Lord. In verse 58, Paul said, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And then he gives the reason in the last part of this, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Now I'll tie back to the first verse on vanity. At the beginning I asked you, no one wants to do anything in vain. You don't want to tie your shoe and have the shoelace break. You don't want to put something back together and realize you left a part out. You don't want to invest your life in a work, a business, a farm, or a ministry for a year and a half and have it turn out in vain. And Paul's point in verse 2 was, I didn't want you to have believed in vain. And he wraps right around to that in verse 58 when he said, you can know that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. There's the reason to keep on in the work of the Lord as God gives you opportunity. And Paul says, always abounding, which is a superabundance, is going way beyond. Put all your energy, that's how I'm phrasing it for you, put all your energy in the work of the Lord because you've got a reason for it. Christ is risen from the dead. And all of what verse chapter 58 talks about, this is the future, this is how we're going to have new bodies, all of that, death will be conquered, all of that is reason to put all your work and all your energy into the work of the Lord. Hold fast and abound in the work of the Lord. And if you do that, it will not be in vain. And that's Paul's closing point at the end of chapter 58. Today I'd like to challenge you then that if you are unsaved, you have to believe and fully accept that which is of first importance, as Paul said in verse 3. I delivered to you of first importance what I also received. You must begin there. Christ died, Christ was buried, Christ rose from the dead. And there's a significant reason to believe by faith in him. But then for those who are saved, recognize that Satan uses his proxy voices. Those are people speaking in his behalf, speaking, saying things and whispering in your ears or speaking through your conscience saying, this is a lie. Your prayer is ineffective. This is a lie. And he, this is a lie that he's saying, um, no, the Bible says that, but it doesn't apply to you. Or, no, your witness is really not that effective. Or, no, evil is going to conquer and triumph finally. Or, no, um, your little sin is not that big a deal. You can just sort of ignore that and go on living a Christian life. And probably, probably every other Christian in the church probably has something like that too. So therefore, don't worry about it. But if you have that and harbor that lie in your heart, you are not holding fast. And there's no way you can abound in the work of the Lord. Paul says... Hang on, be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. It's all by his grace. It's all by what he has done. Paul pointed that out, too, in one of the verses. Um, That's where we have to rest today. So today, on Resurrection Easter Sunday, let's rejoice in the fact that there's a strong reason for us to believe the resurrection and a strong reason for us to hold fast and for us to abound in the work of the Lord going forward. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we would reflect upon the mighty message that Paul put in this chapter, God, I pray that you'll speak to my heart. I pray that you'll help me to remember the importance of holding fast, of being steadfast, of being immovable in my faith and trust in the truth of your gospel and what it says. I pray that you'll close my ears to the lies of Satan as he would seek to whisper or to shout in them his lies that would cause me to question you or to question whether or not I need to abound in your work. I pray, Father, for your children here today, everyone that's here, that you would overrule the influence of Satan as he whispers in ears and plants lies to discourage and take away the morale from your children. May we all hold fast in the confidence that as Christ rose from the dead, so too we we shall as well one day. I pray, Father, that you'd bless
our meager and faltering attempts to complete and do your work on the stages which you give each one of us. And I pray that you will bring back fruit that would last in terms of eternity. For to this purpose you have chosen and ordained us. May your blessing be on your children. I pray that you'll encourage each one of your children that's here today, each one, Lord. I pray that you would help him or help her to continue on in his or her faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work that Christ has done as he conquered Satan and conquered death. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.